software is, is uh, made available to our broad NERSC user community. So today I'm really pleased to have both Steve and Mustafa, who are our machine learning engineers at NERSC, uh, talk to all of you about the production capabilities that we've been developing over the past few years. All right, uh, Steve, Mustafa, take it away. Okay, so um, hi, let me share my screen. One second. Okay, I hope you can all see my screen. Yep. Okay. So hi, uh, I'm Mustafa. I'll uh, talk. Uh, I'll uh, start the uh, the talk, and then um, Steve will take it uh, on from halfway through. So, uh, as uh, Prabhat mentioned, uh, this talk will cover um, the deep, the production capabilities that we have uh, at NERSC for uh, deep learning. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, deep learning for science in general, um, and then talk about the stack, um, uh, what we uh, provide, and um, also the different frameworks and uh, benchmarks of uh, performance benchmarks uh, for uh, the different frameworks that we have. We'll also uh, show some results from our latest machine learning at NERSC survey. Uh, these are still preliminary results. I'll talk about uh, that in a, in a minute. So we'll, we're trying, we'll try to leave some time for um, uh, questions at the very end, but please, uh, during the talk, if you have any questions, just um, uh, ask. That will probably make the presentation a little bit more interactive, given that we are all on Zoom. Okay. So uh, deep learning for science, uh, as uh, you all know, deep learning now is uh, becoming um, um, uh, a very uh, big research area in science. Um, the hope is that it will help with um, analytics for large scale data sets. Um, and um, uh, um, uh, that's, that's the major application of, um, uh, uh, of deep learning right now in, uh, in science. Uh, the other two areas are for accelerating expensive simulations. Um, that's a, a very big research topic, uh, for example, for all the uh, um, uh, chemistry simulators, PDE solvers for climate systems, fluid dynamics, um, and um, uh, also for high energy physics simulations. Uh, um, it's uh, it's it's one one of the opportunities is to use deep learning to accelerate these uh, very exp comput computation expensive simulators, and then in the area of uh, real time control and design of experiments, uh, that's an area that. Uh, uh, we think that deep learning will will be very effective, and um, uh, more re we're seeing more research in, in that area. Um, deep learning for science is, um, uh, as you have seen, uh, there's a rapid growth in, in machine learning conferences in that area, and we have also seen um, uh, major prizes um, granted to to deep learning. Um, Funding agencies are um, are focusing heavily on um, on AI for science. Uh, there are big opportunities there. Uh, we have seen calls recently from ASCAR and uh, and um, ECP is already working on uh, have uh, deep learning programs. Um, the AI town halls, the four AI town halls that happened, AI for science town halls that happened, have produced a very long report on the different opportunities and different uh, domains of uh, of science. Uh, the report is linked here. I think it gives an, um, a good overview of uh, what are the milestones and the um, um, that we need to achieve to affect it and the opportunities um, uh, for deep learning. And uh, finally, we are expecting um, an ECP-like program on uh, AI for science uh, uh, that will um, uh, be a major effort uh, for for the DOE. Okay, so deep learning. Uh, deep learning is is um, uh, a sub branch of machine learning. It solves the same problems that machine learning tries to solve, uh, but using neural networks. Um, so we will see. Uh, uh, currently, we use neural networks for the same problems, like for supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. But um, um, the same tasks that you can solve with traditional machine learning are now much more. Um, um, uh, it's much easier, more effective to solve them using uh, neural networks. I won't go into the details of what neural networks are, but we will talk about uh, the workloads that these neural networks um, uh, need to, to, to develop and, 
and deploy and also um, about the, uh, the different scales, uh, the, all the computational uh, needs uh, related to, um, to building and uh, deploying neural networks. Before I go on, so we will be showing results from um, uh, the survey, the machine learning at NERSC survey uh, that we have in 2020. Um, these are still preliminary results. We are, the survey is still open. So if you haven't uh, responded to the survey yet, we are, uh, um, please respond. Uh, we, uh, the data helps us in so many ways. So um, the, uh, the survey tries, it uh, targets uh, the scientific communities, uh, both NERSC and non-NERSC non uh, users. Uh, and we mainly focus on communities that uh, could use HPC system, uh, HPC resources for deep learning. We try to track different trends, uh, so things like problems, workload, model architectures, framework, uh, scaling strategies, uh, hardware and software, the hardware and software needs of machine learning, um, and many other things. We try to track them in the survey, and we we often make the uh, the, the results public, so it it serves us and serves um, other be people beyond uh, NERSC. Um, the survey is also a um, um, a very good way for us to understand what are the use cases of uh, of the stack uh, that we have and also for identifying areas for to improve user experience and performance uh, in the near future um, and uh, it also helps us anticipate what kind of workloads we will have in the near future and uh, prepare for that and as you can see in these plots um, um, the the respondents are span multiple domains okay so now back to deep learning. Um, we will be talking about things that are related to different aspects of the deep, lear the deep learning workloads. Uh, but just to outline what is going on. So when you're developing uh, neural networks, um, there are uh, different stages. Uh, one of the stages is uh, uh, training the models. So you need to, uh, you have a, a neural network and you want to train uh, that neural network, which is trained on a large amount of data. And usually, especially for science, as I'll, as I'll show in a little bit, we have um, uh, very large scale data sets and deep learning by its nature is, um, um, is very data intensive. And this process is very iterative and uh, also often requires interactivity with the computer, compute, uh, compute resources. Um, at some stage in the development, you would decide on um, roughly what kind of model you would need to use to solve your problem and all um, sorts of metrics that you need to monitor and uh, your data sets and all of that. After that, you need to, uh, to tune different hyperparameters uh, that are mean either hyperparameters for the model architecture, like for example, the number of layers that you would have or the number of neurons and parameters and all of that or things related to the training, like um, uh, how do you, you use, we use uh, uh, gradient descent to train these models so that, that has multiple parameters. And there are so many other parameters. To do that search on these parameters is a very compute uh, intensive process. So you need to, to launch hundreds of experiments to, to test which parameters could work best uh, for this. And this, uh, this process requires both um, um, uh, parallel experiments, so the experiments could be using multiple um, uh, GPUs, for example, uh, but, it, uh, but it also mainly requires um, uh, capacity that you can launch hundreds of experiments at the same time. Once you have trained your model, then um, you want to use that model in real life if you're not only doing research, and that is what we call inference. So you take a frozen uh, trained model and then you apply it on, uh, on data. Uh, that's mainly for data analytics, uh, but, um, and uh, sometimes it's used in offline analytics, and, but it could also be used in online analytics, like for example, for all the, um, um, the cloud providers or, or like services like Google and Facebook, they would need to use um, these mo the trained models in real time. This is not like a clean separation between training and inference. You could have, uh, for example, if you have a setup of active learning, you have some model that you're training uh, along with from data that is coming from your simulator. So you could be running a simulator and training your model using and using the model at the same time. So you acquire more data using the simulator, you improve the, uh, the performance of the model and then use it to, um, uh, to you query the model for um, as you're, you're, you're running your simulator for to improve the simulator speed. So uh, there are uh, instances where you would need to do both training and inference and that requires its own 
um, uh, it has its own challenges. For example, if your model, if your simulator is running on CPUs and then and your model is running on uh, uh, GPUs, that's something that would need to be uh, uh, thought thought through carefully. Um, we see from our user surveys is the same thing in 2018 and 2020 that currently people are mostly focusing on um, uh, developing models, but they uh, and that's what most of the demand goes through to. And then in the near future, in the future, people expect to be doing more inference using their models. So, um, as I said, these models could be um, uh, very large. Uh, there are so many ways to show how uh, large these mod models could be and how much resources uh, they need um, to train. But one of the ways is just to look at how long it takes people to uh, to train their models. So you can see to the left here, this is a queer, this is a, a survey question of how long it takes people to train their model, and most people takes hours to days. And 15% uh, in this survey show that they need weeks to train their model. And um, think of this as a compilation time for your software. If it takes you weeks to, to, to compile your, your code, it would take forever to actually develop something that works. Um, so this needs to be, this, uh, the, this training time needs to be um, reduced uh, uh, tremendously. And for this, we need scale. We need HPC systems to be able to, uh, to do this training faster. Um, you can also look at the data sets, especially in science, the data sets that people have to uh, train on. Um, it spans uh, multiple ranges, but um, um, non-significant portion here needs to, to do tens, tens to hundreds of gigabytes and also uh, terabytes of data. And that takes a very long time. Um, another, you can also see uh, like the trend in general in, um, uh, in deep learning since um, uh, its onset, uh, or at least its recent uh, onset, uh, we have more and more complex models, and these complex models, they need more uh, compute to train. Um, and the trend that we see right now is that the more complex the task that you need to solve, uh, you need to develop a more complex uh, model for that. And to, to, to train that model, you need more data and more compute. And this is a logarithmic growth uh, in the compute time. And we don't expect this to come down, um, uh, to slow down anytime soon. We also see that uh, in the survey um, uh, results, we see that uh, people use, um, uh, mainly use single, uh, that's, I assume this is mostly for uh, development, but um, uh, then after that, you, you also need uh, multiple GPUs, some between a single node that has four to eight GPUs and then hundreds uh, of GPUs to train models. So to, uh, to achieve that, how do you actually achieve uh, uh, parallelization and, and practice? Uh, there are multiple uh, modes of doing that. Uh, the most common one is data parallelism, where, for example, you have a very large amount of data, you need to uh, to pass through that data multiple times much faster. So what you do is instead of having a single worker um, uh, processing your data, you have um, uh, data parallelism. So you clone your model on multiple workers in this, for example, GPUs or nodes, and then each one of them will process its own batch. And then you do all reduce on the gradients and propagate them back and update your parameters. Uh, that is the most common um, uh, mode of parallelism and we will show the results that we'll show in this um, uh, in this talk are mostly are actually all on data parallelism performance on uh, at NERSC. Uh, other modes of parallelism, as um, these models become more complex and you need to uh, to build bigger models, you need to to go into model parallelism. Uh, model parallelism, uh, one way of doing that, you would take you would take a single layer from um, uh, your neural network and you split uh, split that layer itself on multiple uh, workers, um, and then um, yeah, and then you process uh, you process your data. So this is this is typically used for very large models. For example, the models that you, you see for for like all uh, translation um, uh, models that, uh, for example, Google Translate, uh, that's a model that uh, needs some model parallelism. Uh, another way of doing uh, this splitting your your large model over workers is to do a pipelining, which is instead of splitting the layer itself over multiple workers, uh, you split um, uh, the layers among uh, multiple workers. So you have the first layer here on a, on, a, on, a, on a GPU, and then the second layer on a different GPU, and you have some layer pipelining. Both of them have their own uh, challenge, communication challenges and um, opportunities for optimization. 
And uh, finally, actually in practice, you can imagine that you actually need hybrid, um, hybrid parallelism. So if you have very large models to train you, they, those need a lot of data. And if they need a lot of data, then after you split your model over multiple workers, you need to do data parallelism. You have groups of work, workers for the model and then um, um, uh, multiple of those groups to do data parallelism. So in practice, eventually you would need to do mostly hybrid parallelism. Um, if you ask the um, uh, people who are doing this, um, uh, developing models, you would see that uh, most people um, are doing data parallelism right now, and that's what they expect to do in the, um, uh, in the future. But uh, other modes of parallelism um, is needed uh, either now or projected to be needed soon. Um, to do that, uh, to accomplish this, the, uh, this parallelization, you need some framework that helps you do that. So TensorFlow and PyTorch, which as I will talk later, um, they are the main frameworks, uh, the most popular frameworks for doing deep learning. Um, and they both have um, um, some parallelism, native parallelism, um, support for native parallelism uh, routines. And um, th they are the most common way to, to, um, to actually uh, distribute, it, distribute training, uh, especially for PyTorch. Most people use um, their native, um, PyTorch native uh, parallelization API. Um, next would be Harvard, uh, which is an Uber uh, framework for doing uh, data parallelism uh, and it supports uh, multiple backends. Uh, so for example, MPI or uh, Nickel. Um, and uh, as I'll mention later, um, we use those on, on CPU and GPU. And um, yeah, so Harvard is very popular and it's very easy to use. And we expect to, to have Harvard for uh, a while. And there are other frameworks that people are experimenting, developing or experimenting with. So that's uh, on the introduction. Now to what we actually have at NERSC. Um, so um, our strategy for, um, for, for, um, uh, for our stack is uh, to have uh, the most popular frameworks and uh, to work with the vendors to uh, make sure that um, the underlying libraries, the backend libraries are optimized on our machines, whether the, um, the CPU uh, partition or the GPU partition. So we do work with um, um, Intel and uh, NVIDIA on, on both and also Google and Facebook for optimizing uh, the frameworks themselves. We, um, we, were, we also focus on providing productive uh, platforms, not only compute resources, but also ways to access those uh, compute resources uh, conveniently and to, uh, especially for the kind of workflow that goes while you're developing deep learning models. Um, and we also provide training and consulting and we have multiple collaborations, um, um, especially at this stage where uh, deep learning is picking up in science. So we make sure that we work closely with um, a lot of uh, the users and we also have personal collaborations um, uh, with them to essentially provide cons whether consulting on the algorithm side and the science side or on the technical uh, side. So we will be going through uh, some of these things uh, in these slides. Okay, so um, our um, most anticipated moment for compute resources is to have our next machine, uh, Perlmutter machine, which we expect to have the first phase of that in uh, uh, later this year or late this year. We'll have 12 um, uh, GPU cabinets um, and uh, which will house around more than 6,000 um, uh, NVIDIA Ampere GPUs, uh, which were just announced yesterday. Um, we will have also very large um, uh, storage um, area that is very performant for, especially for um, kind of workloads where you need a lot of uh, I/O like deep learning. And then by mid next year, we expect to, to have the second phase, which will uh, which will add um, uh, CPU only cabinets, 12 AMD CPU only cabinets. So um, yeah, we expect to have more deep learning on Perlmutter than uh, we currently have now. Okay, so for frameworks, um, there are there are multiple frameworks on the um, uh, uh, on the market. Um, they are mostly dominated. If you look at the plot to to the right of uh, what people are actually using in practice, uh, for traditional machine learning, we use Scikit-Learn, and that has been uh, the dominant framework for an extent for a very long time. 
Um, and, um, but for deep learning, uh, people use both Keras uh, and TensorFlow. And most of the time when they say Keras is a an, is an, uh, high level API um, description, and there are multiple implementations of that. But um, uh, the TensorFlow implementation is what mostly uh, people use mostly, and that uh, uh, essentially has Keras API with TensorFlow backend. Uh, and then PyTorch is on the rise, and it's now uh, a lot of people who are doing uh, deep learning, especially for research, are using uh, PyTorch. And there are other um, uh, frameworks. This is this column here is TensorFlow one versus TensorFlow two major um, releases. Um, we think these are um, um, uh, the most functional and performant um, uh, frameworks. Um, and uh, we, as I mentioned, we work with vendors making sure that they work efficiently on, uh, on our machines. And we also have in our, uh, yeah, I'll talk about this in a, a little bit. But um, so for um, the distributed training, we focus on Harvard um, and uh, the native TensorFlow and PyTorch uh, distributed training um, uh, plugins. And for uh, productivity tools, um, uh, uh, we make sure that uh, people have uh, uh, access. Uh, Jupyter is one of the most popular ways of, um, of developing uh, models, at least during the uh, development stage. And um, uh, doing um, deep learning in Jupyter is, uh, is now one of the things that most, um, uh, yeah, the most popular way of actually doing uh, uh, Jupyter. Um, uh, deep learning models development. Steve will talk a little bit more about that today. So in terms of the installations of these softwares, we, we provide the um, uh, modules. Um, uh, we build uh, these libraries and, and modules as uh, I'll mention this a little bit later, but the majority of people, the message here is that 90% of, um, uh, at least of the survey respondents, they use uh, the nurse modules directly. And then sometimes they have to either customize the, the, their Conda environments or build their own Conda environments. And that's the next uh, most uh, available way to, to, or common way to do this. Um, and then some people build uh, from source. We do provide help with all of these. Uh, a word on um, uh, the frameworks and their popularity. Uh, there were other frameworks on the market like Cafe and, um, uh, Cafe and uh, Fiano, um, both of them are um, dwindling in popularity. Uh, this plot at the at the top is um, is only is the mentioning of these uh, frameworks in um, machine learning papers uh, and up to 2018, uh, which is I expect that this is even uh, uh, more the case now that uh, Cafe and Fiano are uh, nobody is using or less and less people are using them. For the survey, for example, we didn't have anyone who said that, uh, that they're using either Cafe or Tiano. And another way to look at this is to look at the Google search trends. And as you can see, um, the PyTorch was rise, um, uh, rising since 2017. Um, and over at least over the past year, we see at least the, the average of these uh, uh, splits between TensorFlow, Keras, and PyTorch Google search uh, trends uh, are stable. Um, it's hard to actually get more, um, I mean, it's hard to get more um, um, concrete uh, statistics of what are the popularities of these uh, frameworks. Um, but uh, generally people use PyTorch for research and uh, TensorFlow has a lot of um, uh, deployment um, ecosystem uh, that people like to use, but that's, that's not a hard split really. Okay. So uh, more on the popularity of different of, of deep learning. Uh, so the top right plot shows the, the increase in the number of CPU and GPU users at NERSC. Uh, this is only for two months, uh, April and May. Um, and as you can see, it has been more than doubling uh, every year since 2017. And we also see a significant portion of users now are using uh, PyTorch. On the uh, GPU partition that we have, which is a small test partition um, that has um, uh, 18 nodes with eight uh, voltas each, uh, more than 70% of the workload is um, uh, gone to deep learning. And uh, it's not only that people are doing uh, single GPU uh, stuff, the, the deep learning workloads are spanning all sorts of scales, all the way uh, to the, uh, the entire machine almost. Okay, 
So on how to use the, uh, the software stack, as I mentioned, the, we have multiple ways of, uh, you, you have multiple ways of doing that at NERSC. Um, the most straightforward way is just to check the module. So for example, you can say module available TensorFlow or PyTorch, um, and uh, you'll see the different versions, and then you can load the version that you want. Uh, these modules are, um, uh, we, we put the most performant uh, versions of the libraries that are available, and we also try to include everything that, all the packages that you might need. But in case if you want to uh, customize your installation further, you can always say, you can always install things in your user area. So that's, that's the, uh, the, the most popular way of, of uh, customizing environments, or at least that's what we recommend uh, right now. If you want to build more than that, you want to install other, uh, other versions um, of uh, frameworks that we don't have, or you want to do your own thing, you can always create your own Conda environment. But if you want to know which versions of TensorFlow and PyTorch uh, to install uh, for best performance on our machines, especially for distributed training, for example, of PyTorch, please consult the, um, uh, the docs. And if there is anything missing from there, uh, please let us know. But it's important not to install um, uh, the default TensorFlow or PyTorch uh, options for performance on both CPU and GPU. And for accessing the stack from Jupyter, we provide um, uh, we provide the uh, kernels uh, to use TensorFlow and PyTorch, the different versions uh, from Jupyter. You can also build your own custom kernel around your Conda custom uh, Conda environment, and the details are available in the uh, docs. So moving forward to um, uh, for um, currently for the current uh, Core GPU partition and also for Perlmutter, we hope to provide um, uh, the entire stack in shifter images instead of modules. Uh, the reasoning is that um, uh, Nvidia provides um, highly optimized uh, containers for uh, perform uh, performance on GPUs. Um, and uh, we currently have, we're currently testing that. We think we have something that uh, you can start using um, and you can use that both in uh, interactive, actually in interactive batch system and also in, in Jupyter, uh, through Jupyter. Um, for interactive, this is how you would load it. Um, you would load, for example, a PyTorch, um, um, a PyTorch image. Uh, and for if you are submitting uh, batch jobs, please make sure to put the image not in the command of shifter, but use the slurm um, uh, sh shifter op options. Uh, that will give you much better performance, especially in if you're training um, distributed. And uh, we have um, also TensorFlow 2 uh, right now. And if you have, uh, we are uh, looking forward for feedback on these images. So if you test them and uh, um, there is something that you don't like or it's not working for you, please let us know. You can also use those from, uh, from Jupyter and we do have uh, Jupyter kernels to use this, these same shifter images. Okay, so our general guidelines, I kind of said a few things here and there of what we recommend, um, but um, so generally just to recap, we, we generally uh, recommend that you use the modules directly um, to run TensorFlow or, or PyTorch. Uh, they do have the, mo the recommended builds and libraries, as I said earlier, and they, are, they will give you the best performance on our machines. And also, most very important for us right now is to, we're, we'll be able to, um, uh, to track the usage uh, of the uh, compute resources and the stack, and that helps us also decide on support strategy. For if you want for developing and testing your uh, your workloads um, uh, using the interactive QoS on uh, KNL or KNL on Haswell, the CPU partition uh, or Jupyter on demand compute resources uh, are very convenient, and we recommend uh, to use uh, TensorBoard for visualization uh, on our machines. And um, uh, Steve will talk about this in a little bit. For performance tuning. Uh, there are, uh, as if you have trained a deep learning model before, you'll know that there are so many moving parts and uh, especially in, when it comes to IO um, and then performance on a single uh, GPU or a 
single node or multiple GPUs, and there could be a lot of bottlenecks uh, in that. So uh, at some point, you might want to, to tune your model for, for faster um, uh, turnaround and training. And um, the, the way to do that, the first thing you can do is just to use to check the CPU and GPU utilization. Um, and uh, that also gives you uh, the memory usage of just using top or NVIDIA SMI that will give you an idea of what's going on. You can also track, for example, if you're using GPUs, you can track NVIDIA SMI and, uh, and plot that. Uh, or if you're using any uh, productivity framework, uh, monitoring framework, some of them provide um, a way to visualize the utilization. And that's your first hint of uh, at least how, how efficiently you're using um, your compute, the compute power available to you. For um, if there are issues, the most common problem with the performance is uh, the data pipeline not being optimized, and not has some bottlenecks. And um, um, the, what we recommend right now is to use uh, either TensorFlow or uh, PyTorch uh, data loaders. Uh, they have uh, data loaders that allow you to essentially tune uh, the performance and the number of CPUs available to, uh, to the data loader part of the pipeline or um, uh, the number of uh, like prefetched, for example, data samples that has uh, to bring and then do some data implementation on it. And, and also like the number, of, like how many of those you can ship to the GPU uh, ahead of time before the GPU actually needs it. So there are a lot of knobs that you can use to tune the performance. And um, for if you're doing I/O, especially if directly from desk, uh, then we recommend that you use um, uh, the burst buffer um, for um, for that. That will give you much better performance. If you need to do more than that, there are profilers that you can use, like C profile uh, or NVIDIA DL Prof, which are on um, uh, for GPUs. TensorBoard is uh, recently started providing uh, profiling tools in TensorBoard for, te for uh, TensorFlow. And um, um, that is something that uh, you can also try. For distributed training for on with TensorFlow, we do recommend that you use Harvard. Uh, we think uh, Harvard is, um, uh, as I said earlier, it, um, uh, it compiles with both MPI. It can use uh, MPI or nickel backends. Uh, on our uh, GPU, uh, CPU machines, uh, MPI, would, we compile with Cray MPI, which uh, will give you best performance there. And um, for uh, the, our GPU machines, uh, we compile it with uh, Nickel backend, and that gives, that gives much, much better performance, as you will see later, Steve will show. Um, and we do, the, you can use the Harvard examples should run uh, out of the box in our machines, but if you have problems with that, you can consult the docs or uh, check with us. And as I mentioned, uh, TensorFlow has profilers that you can uh, check, especially if you're doing uh, training on GPU, it has a lot of uh, features. Okay, so for uh, PyTorch uh, distributed training, we recommend that you use distributed data parallel API. Uh, there is another one that is called data parallel and that is the easiest to use, but it's not um, uh, the best performance wise. Um, so we recommend that you use a distributed data parallel. It allow it is very easy to do intranode and internode um, uh, distributed training with that, um, and it works seamlessly with CPUs and uh, GPUs if your code is optimized to um, um, to do that. Not optimized, like written to to actually switch between CPU and GPU seamlessly. Um, and uh, again, the same case here with um, uh, on our CPU partition, um, the PyTorch runs with the uh, back MPI backend that gives this performance and uh, on the uh, GPU partition, uh, Nickel backend gives the best performance. Okay, I think uh, that's it. So I'll hand it over to Steve. If you have any questions before I give it to Steve. Okay. I have one, Mustafa. I, yes, um, please. I'm wondering, what do you anticipate will be like the, the biggest challenge getting these tools up and running on um, Perlmutter, you know, if any? Um, I, I think testing on uh, Cori uh, GPU has helped us a lot understand what is, um, uh, what is coming. We did sort out so many issues. 
uh, Steve will show some of these results. Um, currently, we expect that we'll be able, in terms of software running, uh, it will, we hopefully, everything will run fine and can run um, uh, out of the box. Uh, there are some, um, some things related to uh, the networking and if um, uh, we will be able to use um, uh, nickel on uh, the network that we have on, on Perlmutter, um, that's something that um, uh, we're currently investigating. Um, but in terms of um, uh, the software stack, um, uh, I think it, it, it will run, we will be, at, you know, for the first period, it will be all right, given what we have done on Core GPU. Thank you. And along the same lines, uh, do you have any thoughts about like what the presentation of GPUs and the DP, uh, the DL stack should look like through Jupyter on Perlmutter? Or do you have things you wish would happen there or that you think people would like? Um, uh, I, I think what we currently have is, um, um, at least our uh, first order will work fine. Uh, the, the few things that uh, we'll need to sort out is how do you um, run, what is the best way to run multiple, multi-GPU, multi-node uh, training from Jupyter, uh, which is something that um, uh, Steve has, uh, so he will talk a little bit about one solution to do that, but uh, we're still not sure if that would be the best way to do it. Um, but, and that's something that we're, is on our list to actually sort out soon. I think I, I talked to you a little bit and you, you provided the uh, access to multiple multiple GPUs from, from Jupyter, at least in the test, um, uh, testing Jupyter. And uh, we're still not sure how to actually integrate the, to allow the, the Jupyter um, you know, job to actually run on multiple uh, GPUs in, in the best way. Uh, other things are, uh, related to the profiling, um, likely, as you will see here, TensorBoard will, will be running from, from Jupyter. I'm not sure if at some point we will need to have uh, the ability to, to monitor, um, uh, uh, yeah, to, to monitor Jupyter neural networks training um, or profile, profile that if it would work out of the box or not with, with what we have right now. Um, that's a lot of like, random things, but um, um, it's something. It's something that you would need to investigate. Other than that, I I, I don't have. Uh, I, I don't think there are other things that are you know pressing issues with using uh, Jupiter on Perlmutter. We can come back to the Jupiter thing at, at the end. I think. Um, yeah. We, we, should probably, <laughs> we should probably get going, Mustafa. And then people can ask more questions at the end. Is that okay? Yeah. So I'm going to start talking about um, some workflow, workflow tool things that we offer and then get into other things like performance and benchmarking. Does this work? Yes. Okay. Uh, just let me know if you don't see it. I'm assuming you do. So first, uh, Jupiter, which is what we were just talking about. So um, hopefully, probably we're all already familiar with what Jupiter is and how popular it is. We have a Jupyter Hub service at NERSC. It provides this really nice notebook ecosystem to be able to interact with our systems on Cori. Uh, it's very popular among our NERSC users. Something like 700 users, I believe, use Jupyter at NERSC. And in our uh, our survey, from our survey, it's clear that a lot of users use Jupyter to actually do the R&D for their machine learning. Uh, so for deep learning, users can use Jupyter to deploy their workloads onto our systems. It works on both Cori CPU and GPU. Uh, thanks to Roland for setting up the integration with GPU. We have our provided software kernels. I think Mustafa mentioned that briefly, but uh, you can see the list. I think that's all of them down on the bottom. Um, it's basically a subset of our module installations, but users can also build their own kernels, deploy their own kernels from, for example, Conda environments. And so there's a link to the docs page on how to do that. Uh, with Jupyter, there are a lot of tools that you can, uh, you can access. So one of these is, is TensorBoard that Mustafa mentioned. So uh, this is really the de facto way to visualize everything in deep learning. You can see some of the stuff on the bottom right here from your, your model's computation graph to uh, tracking the training loss and accuracy, uh, tracking various different experiments and even like model, um, model weights evolving over time. 
Um, so this started as a TensorFlow um, tool, but has since become uh, natively supported in PyTorch. So there's a lot of good community behind this. And you can actually run TensorBoard in a sort of manual way. You can set up SSH tunneling to nurse can run the server but we recommend actually using jupiter to start it up and to access it and uh we just there's just a tiny bit of boilerplate basically we provide a little helper module you can click on this link here it's a github repo with a single python file in your notebooks you just import the module start up tensorboard and with this line down here you get a url that you click on so you don't have to worry about the um the other stuff um, you can also use Jupyter as, for, uh, as a front end for doing distributed deep learning on our systems. So uh, generally, Jupyter Notebook is running a single kernel process like Python that's executing your, your cells. Uh, but there are these tools and frameworks out there for distributed parallel computing like IPy Parallel, Ray, and DAS that are able to spin up clusters of worker processes, and then you can connect to these clusters and execute distributed workloads. So for deep learning, you can use this then to, uh, to run distributed training or distributed hyperparameter optimization directly from one notebook that might be even running just on CPU. You might be able to submit it to the, the GPU systems. Um, and, and then you can also pull in all this extra cool ecosystem stuff that's in Jupyter, like interactive widgets to do monitoring and, and steering your workflows. So this was a little while ago now, I think 2018, but we put together some, uh, some notebook examples that use this. And we chose IPy Parallel and Kale. Uh, Kale with Kale, we, we worked with some uh, collaborators in CRD, uh, Matt Henderson and Shreyas Cholia. But for, um, uh, for IPy Parallel first, we have a couple notebooks here to demonstrate how you can do distributed training and, and HPO, high optimization. So um, it's a cool way to get interactive, iterative distributed training, actually, and we showed that it scales pretty well. And then with the, uh, with the stuff from Kale, we have these cool interactive uh, monitoring widgets. So on the right here, this is a live widget where the table here is full of training tasks. Each row is a, basically a model we're training with a set of hyperparameters. You can click on those, you can view the live results as those models are training, and you can also do things like resource monitoring, um, potentially very useful stuff. Uh, we support a number of hyperparameter optimization solutions. So some of these we prioritize, but others uh, folks can just sort of um, uh, deploy more easily. Um, in general though, hyperparameter optimization, uh, so selecting the right kind of model architecture and tuning the hyperparameters, it can be very critical for getting the most out of deep learning on your problems. Still a lot of people do this by hand, uh, sometimes called grad student descent. But there are a lot of sophisticated methods and libraries for automating this. And this can get very computationally expensive because you end up training a lot of models. So it can be a good fit for HPC resources. Um, down on the right, we asked our users what tools they're using for this. And um, some of these like scikit-learn and Keras Tuner, you know, we don't really need to do anything special for. Um, we've chosen to have, we've, we've chosen to look at a two, a couple of tools to begin with and have prior to, prioritized support for because they map well onto our systems and have uh, nice HPC relevant features like CrayHPO and RayTune. I'll briefly talk about those shortly. Uh, you see users also like weights and biases. That's this one down here in green. Um, some of our colleagues uh, really like that. And that's one that we're looking at closely, but we kind of have to figure out what level of support is gonna be relevant for NERSC here because it is not technically open source, though academic uh, folks can get a free license. So users can use what they like, and I'd like to just um, call out if there are folks who have uh, tried other solutions and deployed nice things on our systems for HPO, we'd like to hear about it, so reach out to us. Uh, so first, Cray HPO, so Cray is our main system vendor, so they made this tool, and obviously it's designed specifically for HPC systems. Uh, that means at NERSC it integrates seamlessly with Slurm. So it actually, it's not going to spin up a cluster of processes that then it sends work to. It's just going to use Slurm directly to manage your allocations. It can request allocations and delete them, and it can launch training tasks directly um, with the Slurm commands. So it has some popular HPO algorithms. It doesn't, it's not a very exhaustive list, but I know they're adding more. Um, and the way it works is the user just defines a training script. It doesn't need to be even machine learning. It doesn't need to be Python, just some kind of executable that can be steered by uh, command line arguments and reports back a figure of merit. So it's very generic. You can use it with any framework. Um, and yeah, because it, it uses Slurm, you can do things like just whatever you can do with Slurm. So you can say each training task should use eight GPUs in a distributed fashion, something like this. So Ben Albrecht, who's an engineer at Cray, put together a nice lecture and some hands-on material that uh, 
that we showed at the uh, Deep Learning for Science School last year. There's some links to the um, material down below. Uh, for Cray HPO again, here's the, our NERSC documentation, the Cray documentation. Here's an example notebook for how you can run this at NERSC. On the right just shows what it looks like for the HPO steering script to do a genetic optimization. So we're defining some, some train script here and then the hyperparameters are set through command line options. I won't spend any more time on that. Uh, Ray Tune. So Tune is built on Ray. Ray is this product that came out of Rise Lab down on campus and Tune is this open source Python library. It can do a hyperparameter tuning and they focus on it being um, very scalable. So they have actually a lot of uh, cutting edge state of the art strategies and some of them are very nice because like I said HPO is very expensive but some of these methods are really made to work well in a uh, restricted computing budget. So the plot on the right shows one of our NISA for learning postdocs Brandon Wood uh, comparing random search to some of these approaches that can actually uh, quit training models early based on um, kind of an outlook of how well they're going to do and that can really really save you uh, computing resources. So there's a lot of cool stuff in Raytune and it also integrates with other solutions. You can read them here. Uh, it can integrate with Slurm, a little bit of boilerplate code and we actually provide a helper thing here that you can click on and get to, to help start up the cluster. So it should hopefully work seamlessly for folks. Uh, this little video here shows uh, Raytune in practice. So this is like a, this is a Slurm script. We can set up the software that uh, the code below is what's actually starting up the cluster. It's not too much code, but then you, you you call this other script, and I think what this is going to do is it's um, it's going to to run the example, and we start to see output. It's reporting that it, you know it has a head node. This is a two-node example, so it's using 16 GPUs to do hyperparameter optimization. One GPU per training. Um, st starting a program, we start to see status. All these uh, pending training tasks is submitting to the cluster, and we're starting to get results because this is a very fast example. All these results for. Uh, training different models and he scrolls up and we can kind of see an updated table here of tasks that have actually been terminated. You see right here, these are ones that were aborted early because they were not promising and we can monitor things like the current accuracies and the current epochs. So a lot of useful stuff there. Uh, oh, got to go back to full screen apparently. Exited. There we go. Okay, now I'll get into some of the performance and benchmarking stuff that we have. So our general strategy here for benchmarking and characterizing their system and software performance is we have a mix of what I basic simple benchmarks that might come from like um, the framework official benchmarks or official examples of models as well as more holistic applications that are actually like science with real data. Uh, so so we'll start with the TensorFlow performance on CPU. So here we take benchmarks from this repository called the TFCNN benchmark. So it has a, some optimized vision models you see here and we supplement with um, a deep convolutional generative model here. And so as you can see, we're tracking performance of these models across TensorFlow versions. We follow up with our um, uh, vendors as needed. And the ones on the right show two holistic science applications uh, this is climate and cosmical applications. There's actually our benchmark, uh, benchmarks from MLPerf, which I'll mention in a little bit. Um, for scaling here, we're demonstrating this with Horovod, which is the recommended solution using the right Cray MPI for the best uh, performance, and it scales pretty well. <clears throat> Similarly, on GPU, we're tracking models and software versions, also comparing to a, um, a test, some test GPU boxes we've had. And then on the right, this is scaling a specific model, Inception V3 on Cori GPU. The yellow model is um, something that we kind of had at first, which was a um, sophisticated um, setup. So we, this was actually a vanilla MPish MPI, so not even CUDA aware. And we kind of see how well that scales. And then we switch to the recommended uh, Nickel library for communication from NVIDIA and we see the importance of using the right communication backend. So the green is the scaling without any actual data IO. And this is really just pushing on the nickel communication that's doing the gradient all reduces and it's near perfect. Uh, and then the blue and red show with a real, um, real data set that's ImageNet. The only difference is that the blue is using the NVIDIA container. So containers are giving us basically close to, um, to native performance and um, sorry, to bare metal performance and scalability, which is good to see. For PyTorch, uh, we have a custom repository here that's kind of orchestrating things, but it does pull official models from TorchVision, these uh, convolutional network models, and then we supplement with 
a 3D convolutional network and an LSTM recurrent network. Um, this code base is using just synthetic data. It's similar to that uh, TFCNN benchmarks, actually. And we can test lots of things, hardware, communication backend, software, and, and so on. Um, the table on the right here shows the hardware uh, results that we have, KNL, Haswell, and GPU. Um, note that, um, you know, it, as to be expected, uh, GPU is the fastest and um, it really makes us excited for, for Perlmutter. Uh, so running the benchmarks in a distributed form, well, actually there's software here too. So uh, first performance on CPU, where it's using, just like with TensorFlow, Intel MKLDNN and Cray MPish. Um, performance is fairly stable across versions and um, scaling is quite good, at least for models where the, you have a favorable ratio of computation to communication. So AlexNet here is poor, but that's because it's a really big model and doesn't actually have many layers. But ResNet and these others are looking quite good. There are notebooks down at the bottom to uh, see the full results. What are we doing here? Try to wrap up pretty soon. Uh, this is the PyTorch performance on, on GPU, where here we're using the recommended nickel backend. We also have results with glue. I didn't show them, but they, they don't scale as well. Um, but on GPU versions, again, performance is pretty stable. The last two things here are actually using NVIDIA containers. They're mislabeled, so ignore the label, but they're fairly recent versions of the containers. And then scalability here is, is pretty good for, uh, for most models. So very nice to see, things are mostly working. Um, so those were what I referred to as the basic benchmarks, uh, but also we wanna do more holistic, real like end-to-end -end kinds of benchmarks. So we're doing this partially within MLPerf. So MLPerf is an organization and set of benchmark suites for machine learning. Basically has, it's, really, it's driven by all the major tech companies, there's very strong involvement from industry, you know, Google, Intel, NVIDIA, all of them. And there's also a bunch of uh, academic institutions and national labs involved. Uh, it has industry standard benchmarks for training and inference. So industry standard, I really mean like the, the applications that are kind of the canonical machine learning applications, like image classification, segmentation, language, uh, recommendation, that kind of thing. Um, but they do have a holistic approach. So it's really about time to solution for training or the throughput you can get in inference. Um, so in MLPerf, we started an HPC working group to try and develop benchmarks specifically for supercomputers. We have a Google group here, a mailing list you can join. It already has over 100 members from uh, industry and labs and stuff like this. These are the co-chairs and deputy chairs. Um, on the bottom also, we have an article that Morali here wrote on Inside HPC. It can give you a lot more background info and cover some of the outreach and preliminary results we have, please reach out to us if you are interested in getting involved in this effort. So I'll just very quickly go through the rest here. We don't need to go through all the detail, but um, you know, this, the motivation here is we need good uh, benchmarks for HPC and we wanna capture the relevant characteristics. So benchmarks that really push on the system in all the ways that are relevant to that big scale. Um, computation, communication, and IO. We wanna collect all these relevant metrics beyond just time to solution. Uh, there are a number of challenges though at, at designing a benchmark suite at this scale. Um, there are actually not a lot of standard applications. So we're kind of taking what has been um, kind of published at venues like SC. Um, large batch training is in general difficult. Don't have time to go into all those details. We have a whole tutorial on that. Uh, and tuning these benchmarks at scale, because we have to kind of restrict the rules and hyperparameters that submitters can use. Uh, this is very expensive. So this is an ongoing process. I won't go into details, but I'll just show we're, we're using uh, climate segmentation, which is a Gordon Bell Prize winning application at SC18. Um, and this Cosmoflow application, which uh, also came out of NERSC folks and was at SC18. Um, so those are the two we're, we're starting with. You can refer to the slides for more details or the papers. Um, we're hoping to do an actual benchmark release this year. So there's uh, ongoing work to kind of finalize the rules, the benchmark details, and open up a submission period. So we hope to get a lot of HPC facilities to participate and um, run the benchmarks and submit results. And we'd ideally like to have results publicly available around the time frame of SC20, but we will have to see. And we're looking at other, uh, other benchmarks as well. I won't, uh, I won't list them, but things that push on, um, for example, model parallelism and stuff like that. Okay, um, shifting into the last session of, section of the talk, I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but just I wanted to call out with a big slide showing that we are involved through science engagements and research projects with a lot of different, um, basically um, scientific deep learning applications. So you can, you can check this out. And this is not an exhaustive list at all. There's a lot of things that we, we are involved in. 
we do training events. So the big one I want to call out is the Deep Learning for Science School at Berkeley Lab. Last year we had a very comprehensive program, lectures, demos, hands-on. You can view all the material from last year at this website, uh, including the videos. Uh, we were going to do it again this year, but due to the uh, situation we're all aware of, the in-person event was canceled, but instead we do hope to do a summer webinar series. Uh, we have this deep learning at scale tutorial that we've been showing at a bunch of different conferences, organized jointly with Cray, but also NVIDIA and Intel has been involved, presented it at multiple SCs, at ISC, the ECP meeting. Uh, we're submitting again to SCE this year, and uh, you can check the material, the latest material from SC19 there. And then one last advertisement is uh, the, this data seminar series, basically. So this GitHub page, um, we should be, should be kept up to date on, on upcoming and things, upcoming seminars and um, it'll have videos and stuff. So in conclusion, um, we don't say deep learning is coming, but really we say deep learning for science is here and it's growing. So there are clearly a lot of powerful capabilities there. We have a very enthusiastic community and growing interest in actual um, workloads um, targeting HPC, which is great. So uh, hopefully we've convinced you that NERSC has a productive and performance software stack for deep learning. We have our optimized frameworks and solutions that are scalable um, and also these um, tools and things that support productive workflows please join the NERSC user Slack. We do have a machine learning channel there. We may use that to make announcements. It's a good place to ask questions and stuff like that. Just build the community. And we've shown a lot of things from our user survey, but as Mustafa said, it's actually still open. So please take some time if you're doing machine learning to, uh, to fill this out. This um, can help inform our strategy and make sure we have the best systems for, for all of you. And with that, then I'll conclude. Thank you.